W-O-V-U-L-P, Cleveland. This is Open Door with Vince Robinson. Conversations with people who are making a difference in the lives of others here and around the world. Culture is at the heart of who you are. Know your culture. Find yourself. Welcome to Open Door. Hello and welcome to Open Door. I'm Vince Robinson and my guest this morning is Silas Ashley. He's a retired educator and he's done quite a few other things in life which we shall get to. But again, uh, as I start the show, I always try to be transparent and let folks know how I know folks. And I know Silas Ashley because he has a connection to Kent State University. I was a student there back in the 70s. He was there a few years before I was, and uh, he served in the capacity as the president of Black United Students, and then his life just took off. So welcome to Open Door, Silas. Good evening. Appreciate being here. All right. Glad to have you, and uh, glad to give you an opportunity to tell your life story. So as I was setting things up, I indicated that you got a prestigious start at Kent State University as the president of Black United Students from 1973 to 1974. Uh, you also disclosed to me that you are uh, from or a product of Cleveland, Ohio, now living in Miami, Florida. So just talk to us about, uh, you know, getting started at Kent State University and uh, your life in Cleveland before you got there. Well, okay, we'll, we'll do, I guess we'll do Kent back. Um, you know, I went to Kent. I started there in the uh, fall of 1969. The um, it was a tumultuous year to say the least uh, at Kent State University. Uh, tumultuous, I guess, in terms of uh, agitation because of the period of time in the country. Uh, but on the other hand, something historic happened that uh, at the time we didn't know it was going to be as uh, historic as it became. Anyway, I'm a freshman, uh, not knowing anything uh, about campus life, etc., and going through the uh, of the motions of that, um, or learning. You know, coming from Cleveland, I went to high school in Cleveland, John F. Kennedy, uh, going to uh, college. Actually, going. To, I should interject this: going to college not because it was intentional. I was literally working in the steel mills in Cleveland, and a friend of mine was going down this place called Kent to get a, an application for college. And it was my off day, so I decided to ride down there with him. Uh, and inadvertently, he picked up two applications. And so on the way back uh, from Kent, I just filled the thing out, you know, because I was bored. And I literally left the thing uh, on the passenger seat when he dropped me back off. He mailed it along with his application. And a month later, I get this thing saying that I had gotten admitted, uh, you know, accepted into Kent State. So I told my parents, voila, so long for the steel mill, I'm going to college. And that's basically how I got there. Um, now, the first year at Kent, I so told you it was tumultuous. Well, they had just had a walkout the prior semester at Kent State, wherein, I should say, I'm going to back up because Kent was on quarters then. Uh, and the quarters, they had a walkout because the black students on the campus had felt that uh, they basically weren't getting their just due and was almost disenfranchised. And one thing led to another, and they had one incident that uh, forced the students to um, decide to literally walk off the campus. And it's one of the first times this had ever been done uh, in a university setting. Why that was important was because the university needed minority students on the campus or they wouldn't get federal funds. So they had to come back and, and do the negotiation. So anyway, this is the atmosphere coming in there. So it was, it was like that. Uh, part of the negotiations that they decided that they were going to uh, institute a black studies program at the university. And so they did, took a couple rooms and they called uh, this it wasn't a department. That's what we called the program was called uh, IAAA, Institute for African-American Affairs. Well, the second quarter, which is winter quarter then, 
And as we came back for early January, okay, there was a discussion that went on in terms of what was going to be done during the month of February. Well, up to this particular point, February, two weeks in it or 10 or 10 days, however, uh, universities and businesses handle it, they had designated for Negro History Week or Negro History Two Weeks. When late January came and there was a meeting between uh, four individuals and they were two students, uh, the newly uh, named uh, chairman for African-American uh, uh, affairs and the dean for human resources. They got together in a meeting and within that meeting, uh, they were going back and forth trying to see what they were going to do. And one, one of the students there named, Far, named Fargo said, well, look, let's do the whole damn month. You know, we can't get this together. Um, the dean said, do you have enough people to do a whole month? Well, at that point, the student got quiet because, you know, they were just making noise trying to uh, get the point across. Well, then the chairman of the, the Institute for African American Affairs, his name was Dr. Edward Crosby, he recently passed. He said, I think I know enough people to, to uh, make that work. And so uh, the dean, he, 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 he wanted to guarantee that they wouldn't be bringing in people like Pee Wee Newton and Bobby Seal from back in that particular day and H. Rap Brown and all those types. And it was a guarantee that, no, they would compromise and bring in people, you know, that uh, were less, we'll say, volatile at the time. Like, they did that. Like Bayard right. Rustin or somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Sorry, I, hear you. I, I had to interrupt. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> you know, yeah. they did that. Yeah. So, yeah, you had a, so they had a whole month of activities, okay? And they, instead of calling it Negro History Week, they called it Black History Month. They actually called it that. And uh, it became recognized because, the, see, when you do anything official on any university campus, it has to be on, on the university calendar. And it was placed on the university calendar. And that's how it got to be legitimate. And that's why at Kent State now, 51 years later, uh, they tell you that Black History Month began at Kent State University because of that, because it actually did. Okay. It was going on nowhere else in the country. Okay. So anyway, that's part of my freshman year. Okay. So I, I, I want to I wanna rewind just a little bit because you just okay. told me that you were working at a steel mill. Somebody sent in an application for a college entrance, and then you ended up getting called to uh, Kent State University. What, yep. was, what was your plan for your life as you were working in that steel mill? <laughs> there was no plan. I, I, when I was in high school, my counselor told me, you know how back in those days, you have what you what you call the seniors go in and meet their counselor, counselor, and they give them advice and direction on life. Okay, when my counselor looked at my record, she said, "You need to um, uh, try to get you a job uh, out there, either in the steel mill or, if you're lucky, try to get on at Ford. And uh, you know that's the best that's the best thing that, that you can do." Mm. And I believe it. <laughs> and that, you know, and and that is sad <laughs> in a way because um, a lot of people. During that time, uh, they relied on their counselors to give them direction. And uh, as a result, I'm sure I wasn't the only one that got that bad information, that bad advice. And they went on to pursue, you know, uh, during that time. Remember now, we're talking, well, in my life, we're talking after 68. The war in Vietnam is, is, is uh, raging. So there were jobs everywhere in terms of blue-collar jobs. Now, the point, though, is you had students who had potential to do other things that basically were advised not to because these counselors, and mine was, was white, uh, had already determined that, you know, I wasn't, quote, college material. That's what I was told, too. Mm -hmm. was material. But at right. the same time, you had an institution that said, we need black students. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They needed them bad. Yeah. And yeah. they uh, 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 they reached out uh, because again, part of the of the uh, agreement when the students walked out is that they were going to increase the uh, black student population uh, at Kent. Mm 
it was, I mean, it was minuscule at that time. We're talking like 250, 300. Mm -hmm. And so they had to uh, increase those numbers. So, yeah, fly, you know, uh, got accepted. And now uh, we have a situation where uh, someone's going to college. That's right. going to be important later on right. because uh, uh, as I got involved in student government, even before uh, getting involved with Black United Students directly, uh, we, did, we had a project where uh, we, we went forth and decided we were going to double the Black population uh, at Kent State. And we had a project where we literally went back to Cleveland and started taking folks um, from the Cleveland school system to come to uh, come to Kent, even even the people from your from uh, your beloved Glenville, mm -hmm. you know, brought them you know brought them uh, down to Kent because of the effort you know to increase a uh, minority's presence on uh, college campuses, particularly yes. uh, Northeast Ohio. So we we definitely have that in common. When I got to Kent State, it was the Institute for African American Affairs, and Dr. Crosby was in his glory there, and uh, they were also on quarters at the time. Uh, but one thing that I did notice that was the black students were predominantly from Cleveland. It, it, it was almost as though all of the students were from Cleveland, but they weren't. But I just, you know, for whatever reason, had that perception. And another thing that I noticed about the quality of student at Kent State, based on the shoulders that I was rubbing uh, in the Institute of African American Affairs, was that there was a definite uh, lack of uh, scholasticity, if I can use that word. I, I just made it up. But there, there, it just seemed as though there were some challenges in terms of the level of, of education that folks from Cleveland had. Mm hmm. OK. Uh, uh, now, if you're using that term in terms of dealing with this new environment, I would uh, 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 say yes. Now, yes, from, from the standpoint is that even though Kent is basically 35 miles from Cleveland, it's more like crossing a, to a different continent, like going to Australia, because it's a total cultural change if you're a black a uh, person going from Cleveland to Kent. Now, I'm not sure had they gotten better when you got there, Vince, but to under let you understand the difference, see, in Cleveland back in those days, radio stations only had 5,000 watts, which meant that a radio station, basically, its, its range was maybe Bedford. So you got you had ABQ and WJMO. They, they go into Bedford. You know, they might on a good day, get to Macedonia, but that's it. So if you're going to Kent, see, there was no connection. Well, okay, I'm going to turn the radio on and I'm going to uh, listen to you know my music. Well, to, to the contrary, no. You, the best shot that we had, I'll never forget the station, CKLW yes. out of Windsor, Ontario. Out of Ontario, came all the way from were, Canada. That's right, correct. Because they had, they were the first one to have a fifty thousand watt uh, uh, power. Mm -hmm. the first one okay and so and so now so we would wait listening to music oh let yeah. me yes listen to music we would wait for that one or two soul records per hour they may play okay all right uh this is very fascinating information uh and we're going to get back to that radio signal and the deficit that occurred as a result of it you're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU. My guest this morning is retired educator Silas Ashley, former president of Black United Students at Kent State University. We'll be right back after this. The Alcohol and Drug Addiction and Mental Health Services Board, also known as the Adams Board of Cuyahoga County, wants everyone to stay safe. If the stress of the pandemic is overwhelming, help is available. Call the 24-hour crisis hotline at 216-623-6888. That's 216-623-6888. If you are using drugs, remember all drugs may contain the highly addictive substance fentanyl. Please test your drugs and never use drugs alone. 
carry Narcan in case you are witness to an overdose and call the 24-hour crisis and referral hotline when you are ready for help. It's 216-623-6888. Again, it's 216-623-6888. This message is brought to you by the Adams Board of Cuyahoga County and WOVU 95.9 FM, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. We're back on Open Door with Vince Robinson and my guest, Silas Ashley, a retired educator. I've also found out that he has been involved in the field of law and a few other things that I don't know about yet, but I will find out as he discloses them. Welcome back to the show. (laughs) So uh, we've just covered quite a bit of ground at Kent State University. Uh, You went from being a witness to the birth of Black History Month in the United States to becoming the president of Black United Students at Kent State University. Obviously, you saw something in the political process that inspired you to take it to the next level. Yes, because before I became president of BUS, uh, I was a student senator. I I got into the uh, overall campus politics as they, uh, they as you will. And what I end up seeing is that they had a structure. It, it was kind of like a person going to Congress and you realizing that, oh, they have they do all these different things here because you know as as, as black students we we basically uh deal with our own culture and there wasn't uh a big interchange or interconnection uh, with everything else that's going on on the campus. Well, when I got into student government, uh, it's two things that happened. I mean, a very close friend of mine uh, named uh, Marvin Johnson, he was uh, uh, in the same dorm I was in, and he got on what was then called the All-Campus Programming Board. If he, if he wasn't the first black to get on it, he was within the first three or four ever to get on this board. Well, the all-campus programming board is that's who brings the entertainment and uh, everything to the campus. So uh, uh, I got in the student uh, into the student center and said, "Man, you know, we need to bring some entertainment here that reflects us. You know, we, we don't have to have everything country western or totally uh, white here." And he presented to the all-campus programming board that. Uh, we bring Sly the Family Stone. Uh, it couldn't have been a better choice because, uh, uh, as you know, that's an integrated group. But they were playing uh, 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 this combo, soul based, you know, with, with a little rock flair to it, and and they had that look. So uh, they agreed to bring this group. You know, it's, it's amazing. Uh, when you have cultural differences, because you always you automatically assume everybody knows, you know, a group because you, you're thinking from your cultural perspective. But see, when you bring other cultures in, they may not know what, what you know. Just like you don't know their groups, you know, they don't know yours either. Well, Sly and the Family Stone was, was an interesting mix. They went with it. And it's probably one of the greatest uh, performances that Ken has ever had. Matter of fact, the, the, the uh, students were so into it until uh, they literally broke some of the bleachers uh, because they were just, it, the concert was just, it had that much energy to it. But the most important thing is, is like anything else, they gave the opportunity for this to happen and now the whole university community saw something different. They saw that, you know, there you can have other things. And so we followed that up uh, uh, the next season uh, with Stevie Wonder, which I run today is his birthday. But we, we followed up uh, uh, with Stevie Wonder. And when that happened, then we were glued in in terms of having ability to, and I want to use this phrase because this is so important, even when I became president and for my life afterwards, we had a chance to have a seat at the table, Vince. Uh, life should be about making sure you have a seat at the table. If you don't have a seat at the table, then you're not a part of the decision-making process, okay? You are, I call them the victim or the recipient of somebody else's edicts. 
You've got to have a seat at that table. That experience allows us to see that we can have a seat at, uh, at that table. And uh, when I became president of BUS, uh, uh, what I believed in was we got to have a seat at the table in everything. Every facet of this university, we need to have somebody there. When they, uh, when I uh, became president, I had the good fortune of they built the new library and they started building. They were just finishing up the student center that's there, down there now. And so uh, we ended up having an office in the, in the student center. And because they had moved everything from what was called then the old student union to the new student union, the old student union became a uh, uh, vacant. So they moved IAAA to the old student union. It didn't have its present name yet. It was still the old student union. And in so doing, it allowed uh, a bus to have office in the, in the old student union, which later became Oscar Ritchie Hall. And over in the, uh, the new student union, because the flow of the campus began to move in that direction in terms of in students interactions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we started to be part of the various committees that all universities have. And we started having a, our own mantra. We started looking at it later on, you know, we were, we, and even when you were there, Vince, we started believing that we were a HBCU at a white school because we started having everything that, that a, a HBCU would have because we had the Institute, you know, we're bringing in the, uh, 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 the, the last poets there. You, you know, Dick Gregory is coming through there. Fela Sawani is coming, teaching classes there. All right. We having we having our own homecoming. We having all of these things that other institutions that are minority dominated uh, would have. We had all of them. So we wasn't missing anything. Yet we was in an environment where we were a distinct minority. Yes. 20,000 20, students that kid. We had like 1,200 black students there. You know, and yeah. you just thought we were we were Howard or, or or Tuskegee or Morehouse or something with the with the activities, uh, the energy and the flow that was coming uh, uh, from the university. Yeah, and well, I I have to co-sign what you said because uh, the the Department of Pan African Studies, which it became uh, before yeah. you know it was IAAA yeah. before it became DPAS, but. It was like an HBCU. I mean, I, I have often thought, you know, wow, what would, have, what, what would it have been like had I gone to an HBCU? But the experience that I had at Kent State was like that experience. As a matter of fact, I had so many credits in the Department of Pan-African Studies that I could have graduated with a double major. So I went to Kent you know. for broadcasting and my degree is in telecommunications but I was afraid that if, you know, if my degree was in Pan-African studies, it would scare radio and TV stations that I might have been interested in working for away. So I didn't declare the double major, but I should have. But it, I'm digressing, but I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, because you understand and you, you understand that point. And sometimes, you know, it's hard for uh, listeners who haven't been there or, uh, or even been through any type of similar experience to actually believe that, wait a minute, you, you have an HBCU style situation on a predominantly white campus or Republican based area, all of that. The answer is yes. Yes, we did. Yeah. And, and the beauty uh, about life as it relates to Kent state. Uh, I gave a speech a year ago and I was talking about uh, black studies programs, et cetera, that began uh, around 1969 and 70. I said, you know, you realize that today over 90% of those programs on white campuses don't exist anymore. So not only at Kent State did it, does it exist, it grew. It grew from being a program into being a department. We now went from having the first floor of the quarter old student union. We have the entirety of Oscar Ritchie Hall, all three floors. So we have grown, which is why I always say, and I always will say, that Kent State is the blueprint. It's the blueprint for the Black experience on a, uh, uh, a predominantly other culture uh, campus. It's also 
And I emphasize this uh, within the university structure. I say it's also the blueprint. If someone is serious about the new vogue, which is diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, if you're serious about that, your blueprint is Kent. Because Kent, if you look at Kent right now, it epitomizes what they say when they when they dream about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, the, the various various uh, uh, department heads, deans, vice president, we have our share there. You know, matter of fact, our literally our share is disproportionate to the numbers that we have there. But that's because we put out good products, and I mean the students who went there. You know. Uh, we didn't just stop there. We went on out there in, in society and made our mark because we learned how to interact in society at Kent State. And we learned the importance of ourselves as a as our culture from the Institute for African-American Affairs, which later became the Department of Pan-African Studies. Yes. So we learned that. And everyone, uh, you, you know, <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir when I'm talking to you. You can always tell them Kent State folks because they're going to question, you know, they're going to ask you why you're doing something and they're going to get involved every time, every time, yes. because that's what we were taught. And we and, and we, we took it away from the university into our respective lives. Yes. Well, I, yeah, I also have to say that there's a bittersweet aspect to this, because even as we're having this conversation you have, you know, you have numbers of black students who come to universities like Kent State University and never set foot in the Department of Pan-African Studies. And it's partly because perhaps the field that they're going into doesn't require that. Perhaps it's because, you know, those classes are not required classes. And, you know, for whatever reason, some black folks just they don't connect with the whole Africa thing. And I get it, you know, based on the present model of education that we're dealing with in the United States anyway. Uh, but, you know, it's gratifying to know that you have folks there like uh, our brother, Mwatapu Okanta, who, as I understand it, is now chair of the Department of Pan-African Studies yeah. and, and, and taking, on a new, uh, taking on a new task in terms of his relationship to the, to the university. That was, you know, the point that you're making there, I mean, come on, on point. I spoke to uh, uh, Oconta last night, and one of the things he was talking about was just the point that you made. And uh, I said to him, you know, you see, when something is evolving, the what you got to look at is in the evolutionary process, some of the things that you did to get you to point A you can't use them once you get in position. I always make the point that you see the revolutionary is never the good person to administrate later on because it, because the revolution is good at, at, at the revolution. OK, once the revolution has gone in a good way, now you've got the structure. So how am I going to make this how am I going to make this work? And at Kent State, one of the good things about the bittersweet part that you're saying, you now we're talking to Conta, I say, you see. You have a generation, actually two generations of students who came from a different exposure and experience before they got to the campus. So they, they don't see things the way uh, that we see it from either a civil rights or black power perspective. OK. I'll pick up later. All right. We're going to get back to uh, the realities of being black at Kent State University and other similar universities when we come back. You're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest is retired educator Silas Ashley. And uh, we'll be right back after these messages on 95.9 FM, WOVU, a Burton Bell Car community radio station. Life is starting to get back on track, and you can too. If you or your family have experienced financial hardship as a result of COVID-19, try seeking help with full tuition assistance. Safely get the in-demand degree or training you need with online and on-campus classes. Go to tric-edu to check out our programs and resources. So, what are you waiting for? Register now for summer classes. Tri-C is where futures begin. What can you do in the battle against COVID-19? Your first task, wear a mask, protect yourself and others. Armor up, armor up, 
Get those hands a 20 second shower with soap and water. Aura, aura. Give up the space six feet just in case. Aura, aura. Get good nutrition in jest for digestion. Aura, aura. Vitamin C, D3, and more. Aura, aura. Elderberries, zinc, and echinacea from the store. Aura, aura. Get some fresh air. Go climb some stairs. Aura, aura. Let go of stress. Make sure you rest. Aura, aura. Your breath is the key to life. Strengthen your immune system, follow the guidelines, and win the battle against COVID-19. Armor up, armor up. We're back on Open Door with Vince Robinson and my guest, Silas Ashley, retired educator. I believe he's a lawyer or he had some relationship to the field of law. And uh, we've been talking about Kent State University just, uh, you know, traveling down memory lane. And, you know, you're talking about the birth of Black History Month at Kent State. And you mentioned the all campus programming board. And, you know, I flash back and average white band was was one of our concerts and we had the renaissance ball and confunction was the headliner and m another year i mean those were probably amongst the best years of my life at that university i found my black man voice at ed kent <laughs> I, I uh i can remember opening for dick gregory he did a a, a lecture or a presentation in the kent state university ballroom and it was my coming of age moment. I did a, uh, I did a poem that day that I had written for Dr. Ann Adams Graves, and it was on the black oh, yeah. attitude of mind, <laughs> and it reflected my perception of black folk from Cleveland. <laughs> but <laughs> after I did that poem, I didn't get any pushback from the Greeks. The sister started <laughs> hollering at her brother. My life changed exponentially. <laughs> After I did that in the Kent State University ballroom, um, let's fast forward because, you know, you've lived quite a life past Kent State University and we spent half of our show talking about your days there. What happened after you left Kent? Oh, I was, you know, it's, it's funny. Again, uh, today I see Stevie, Stevie Wonder's birthday, right? And uh, I, I posted on Facebook about some of the, some of his school. I was posting some of his songs, you know, uh, uh, from the beginning of his career. <laughs> and uh, one of them, one of his biggest hits that even the young folks know today was "Living for the City." Okay, "Living for the City" came out when I was getting ready to graduate from Kent, you know. And there's a line in that song where the where the guy coming out of Mississippi said. New York, New York, just like I pictured it. I graduated on a Saturday. I was in New York City the next day. Mm. Okay, uh, not not. I, I told my my folks. I said I'm going to New York City. <laughs> Why? Because I said it's the biggest city in the country. <laughs> I'm going to hang out there. And uh, I went to New York City. I stayed there. Uh, I, went, I lived in an area called Bed Stuy. See, if you have any younger uh, viewers, I literally live uh, four blocks from where Jay Z grew up in the Marcy Project. So I lived in, in the heart of, this, uh, uh, of it. I, and I got there because back in those days, graduating was in June. So now I get to Bed Stuy in Brooklyn. Uh, in the middle of June, uh, we get there like at midnight, and folks is hanging out. And, you know, I, I'm coming out of Kent. I'm not used to, to a neighborhood like this all jammed up with folks and, and everything, every matter of, of stuff going on, you know. So it was a learning experience to say the least, <laughs> okay, to say the least. And I, I loved it for, uh, I was there one, two, three, four years. And it was, uh, it was, it was my, the next phase of my life in terms of, uh, of having experience and exposure. Because see, uh, the, the the city operates on a whole different groove, and you got to get in that groove, or, or it will swallow you up. Uh, I was able to get in the groove, and interestingly, I you see, I didn't like graduate and then go get a professional job. No, I did nothing the whole summer, and 
I was literally down to my last dime, not figuratively, literally. And I told you I was living in Brooklyn, but I was in the Bronx. Anybody go to New York, you'll know. In the Bronx by Yankee Stadium, I had a dime in my pocket. And I had to figure out how I'm going to get back to Brooklyn because I am just I had just spent the whole summer learning New York underground. Now, those, for those of you who don't believe in divine intervention, you might want to close your ears because this was a divine intervention moment for me. I was standing with a dime in my pocket and I looked up and there was a cab company right there. Um, those people who are from the Midwest don't understand this as deep as someone on the East Coast is. The people on the East Coast, they don't have cars. So there's no need for them to get them to get licenses because they're not driving. They're, they're riding public transportation. Well, I'm from Ohio, so I had a driver's license. So I walked into the cab company, presented myself, uh, said I had a driver's license. They gave me a cab to go work. And uh, quick story, I come out with the cab, and the guy, guy jumps in my cab and says, LaGuardia Airport. And I tell him, sir, I would love to take you to LaGuardia Airport, but I don't know how to get there. And he said, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll show you. Because I had learned New York on the ground, on the subway. I didn't know how to uh, 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 transcend New York above ground. He showed me how to get to the airport. I drop him off. Another person gets there and says, take me to Manhattan. And I said, I'm sorry, sir. I'd love to, but I don't even know how to get to Manhattan. Long story short, I became a cab driver. And that made me learn the city and uh, uh, the income of a, for a cab driver is based upon where you want to go. Well, sometimes naive, naive, naivete works for you because I didn't mind going through the hood and all that kind of stuff because it didn't matter to me. I didn't know it for what it was. So places that uh, people wouldn't go, I went. And so I, I did well, very well as uh, uh, in that. But like everything else in life, uh, it was time to move on. And uh, I, was, I wanted to uh, further my education. And I'm not a person that likes winter. The only reason I don't live in Northeast Ohio right now is because I love Northeast Ohio, but I hate the weather. So I was looking for a place to do graduate work. And uh, I went to a library and I saw New Orleans. Well, when you see it back in the old days of maps, New Orleans is a long word, New Orleans. All right, you write it all out. Then I was applying to a school called LSU. Well, LSU was in Baton Rouge, which is another long word. So when I saw Baton Rouge right by New Orleans, I thought Baton Rouge was a suburb of New Orleans, sort of like uh, 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 Solon would be to Cleveland. That's my impression. So anyway, I applied to LSU, and then I, uh, I had gotten the car at the time. I drove down to uh, uh, New Orleans thinking that LSU was in New Orleans or a suburb thereof, and I come to find out that Baton Rouge is a whole different city. So I ended up going up there, and I ended up going to uh, LSU for grad school. I started grad school. Got to grad school, got to um, um, master's, and then was doing my doctoral work and looked up what the pay was for uh, 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 a person starting out, you know, with their doctorate at, at, on the college level. And at that time, it was something like $15,000. And I said, you no, know, I, I use a, I guess we're on the radio. I, we use the, I use the expertise and said, I made that much driving cabs in the, uh, uh, New York. So I immediately went and applied to law school. And I went to uh, uh, Southern University uh, uh, Law School uh, and became a, uh, you know, and passed, became a lawyer. That's how I ended up, you know, uh, professionally, uh, you know, getting a, van, uh, uh, getting a law degree because, I wasn't going to accept, you know, the starting pay that they that they gave uh, college professors uh, uh, at the time, you know. And then, ironically, I get a law degree, and they asked me to uh, start a, a paralegal program in a, a small uh, college uh, in the uh, how can I call it? Because see, down in Louisiana, they call it down the bayou, but so that you understand, it was going near the mouth of the Mississippi River. A college called uh, Nickel State University. They wanted me to start a paralegal program down there, and I did. And I did. And uh, uh, 
you know, I, I became part of the whole Louisiana culture. You know, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic culture. It really is. You learn uh, different aspects of, of, of the black experience, a totally, uh, totally different thing, you know, there. Uh, it's because Louisiana history is not like, you know, the other states because it was part of, you know, Spain, then France, then became United States. So the, the, the culture and evolution of the black experience uh, was different. So uh, I did that. And then it was time to come to Miami and only because you know, uh, if you spend time in New Orleans, other places like that, they have a, a an accent. And so I had, uh, was married, and uh, I, I told my wife, uh, we, our youngest son, I said, he's not going to grow up and have this accent. This is not going to happen because he'll be locked in. He, can't, he can only stay in this area here because the accent was heavy. And so uh, uh, we came here, we came to Miami here, and we've been here for 32 years. And now, uh, uh, I've worked in education uh, for that time uh, uh, down here, and, and I've had a, a, a great experience. Each place, it, ironically, um, I was involved either in the beginning of a uh, black studies program, which was we did at uh, Nichols State. I, I get here to Miami, and because my two older sons were getting ready to go to high school, I wanted to be part of their high school experience because I think that's an important part for uh, black males so that they don't get uh, uh, shifted down the wrong path. I'll, I'll use that terminology. It's in high school. You, gotta, you, you have to be there with them to help guide them through. I mean, after all, uh, it, it happened to me. So I didn't want it to happen to them. And so I chose to uh, work at their high school, literally. And we started a, a Black Studies program there. We started doing Black events there. And uh, to this day, to this day, it took on and we went to the legislature uh, in, in Florida, and they, they started to have uh, they instituted a statewide mandate for, for there to be a, a black studies program. We did that. Okay. So I, I wanted to back up just a little bit because you talked about getting a law degree, but then you talked about creating a, a, a paralegal program at, at a university. It seems as though your relationship to law was really more academic than it was uh, uh, a traditional law practice. Well, I was I, I was practicing traditionally, but then they, that, this opening came up because they wanted to do uh, at that time. We're talking about the uh, mid to late eighties. Then what happened was they was trying to institute now uh, paralegals to, to work with lawyers uh, uh, in the field. And that was really a, a, a up and coming, you know, a, mm, I guess career for people. They didn't want to go to law school, but they want to work in the law. They want to be do, uh, be researchers, help the lawyers prepare for cases in the courtroom. And um, uh, they asked me to, uh, to uh, would I would actually come down there and uh, put this together? And I said yes. Now I will say this: I have always enjoyed. Uh, the, the, you know, I said retired educator. I've always enjoyed the educational aspect of uh, uh, of life. You know, I have a master's. Uh, 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 in education. So I've always enjoyed that part. So uh, with the students coming in and, and the challenging aspects of it, it was, uh, uh, I, I loved it. And I just, uh, uh, at that point, would only do, would say, well, I still do not, would only do contracts. I would not do uh, other things because in, uh, contracts wouldn't, wouldn't take away from me having the ability uh, to teach. That's oh, what happened. Okay. All right. That's absolutely fascinating. And, you know, I'm listening to this story of someone who went from working to a steel mill to creating programs for <laughs> folks to, to learn how to be paralegals after having been told that you don't need to go to school. Just work with your hands. That's, you know, and that's being steered in the wrong direction. We'll get back to it. Uh, you're listening to Open Door on 95.9 FM WOVU. Vince Robinson with Silas Ashley. We'll be right back. Are you a renter in Cleveland and facing eviction? WOVU 95.9 FM, the United Way of Greater Cleveland, and the Legal Aid Society wants you to know that you have rights. Certain Cleveland families have the right to an attorney in eviction cases. If you rent your home in Cleveland... 
have any kids living in that home, and meet low-income guidelines, free help is available. If you think you qualify, contact Legal Aid immediately at 216-687-1900. That's 216 216- Six eight seven one nine zero zero. You can also apply by dialing two one one on your phone. After a quick screening, you'll know if you can get a lawyer's help for free. Learn more at freeevictionhelp.org. That's freeevictionhelp.org. This message is brought to you by the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, the United Way of Greater Cleveland, and WOVU 95.9 FM. Our Voices United, a Burton Bell Car Community Radio Station. We're back. Open door with Vince Robinson and my guest, retired educator and lawyer, Silas Ashley, former president of Black United Students at Kent State University in 1973. Wow, it's a long time ago. I'm telling on myself. I'm telling on you, too. But hey, (laughs) you know, you're in a good place. You're living in Miami right now and snowbird come back to Cleveland to, to spend the, the summers with us because it's a lot more bearable up here, I think, during June and July than it is in Miami. I can imagine how sweltering it is down there and the humidity and all of that. Great scenery, but it's hot as you know what down in Miami during the summers. So um, you talked about moving to Miami because you didn't want your sons to have that uh, Bayou accent. Uh, how have things panned out for you in that regard? It panned out uh, excellently. I, I, I'm so proud of uh, my three sons. They are all, um, <laughs> it, it, I, ironically, uh, two of the three went to uh, HBCUs. Okay, they went to, uh, uh, they, 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 two or three returned to our family roots. They went to Alabama State, in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, the, my middle son graduated from Tulane. All right, he graduated from Tulane only to end up working at HBCU, which was uh, North Carolina A&T. You know, it's interesting. So uh, they have a, a a wide range when it comes to their educational uh, experience. Uh, I'm a proponent of people having experience and exposure in life. You know, that's whole. That's part of the uh, educational process. You need to travel, uh, see different things. So you have various uh, uh, black cultures within this particular country. But you got to go to different sections of the country to see it, and so they had the uh, they were blessed with the opportunity to actually do that. So you know they're they're, uh, they're well versed, uh, uh, they are totally committed. You know they, <laughs> you know so much so they because see, they have they have children now, and uh, they have to explain their grandfather to their children, and so <laughs> you know. Uh, I I do a, a Facebook post because I think these times I hear some really really uh, uh, intense times in our country. And, and part of the Facebook post, I always are putting in there at the end, uh, fight the powers that be. Well, you know, when you got grandchildren, they they're trying to figure out, you know, so what is Papa saying? You know, when he when he is saying those types of things. So what it does is again, as retired educator. I'm going through this, what I call a renaissance, because you have to explain what that means. And the interesting thing about that, Vince, is, you know, uh, that particular song, you know, came out twice. So you got my sons who are the, the uh, two older ones are in their 40s and the youngest one uh, is, is 35. You see, their fight the power experience uh, is public enemy. Right. But see, I always tell them, you know, uh, way back in the 70s, you know, the Isley Brothers made uh, a same song. And when you look at the lyrics of what the Isley Brothers were talking about, you see, it fits into what's going on uh, in our world today. It fits the same way that what's going on uh, by Marvin Gaye fits. You know, it's just that it, it was more poignant. So therefore, it didn't get the overall play that Marvin Gaye got. But you took the lyrics from the Isley, and then you you incorporate what went on uh, with Public Enemy, and then you get a situation saying, "Well, wait a minute, 
as a, when I'm teaching, I say, so uh, where are we going here? You know, what are we actually doing here? I'm talking about as a people, and I'm talking about now our black experience as it relates to the overall society. Uh, so when I'm talking to them, see, they get it because unfortunately, man, they see too many examples. You know, the, the, the George Floyds and all that goes with that because it, it happens repeatedly over decades. You know, you see all of a sudden now uh, 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 this resurgence, because it's not nothing new, a resurgence of this this whole white supremacy, racist attitude out there. The only difference is that, that at least before it was halfway uh, covert, but now it becomes overt. And so when you start talking about uh, teaching, finding the power of that be, it forces them to have to learn, well, first of all, who the powers that, that be out there are and what can we do to address them? And I would tell them that's the same thing that, that we were talking about way back in 1970. It's 20... It's 2021, 2020, and uh, we have to get to the root of the problem here if we're going to resolve the issue, because obviously we've only been cutting it off at the um, branch and leaf level. We haven't gotten to the root of things. Okay. You mentioned in the pre-interview that you had spent some time in Alabama, and you just referenced it in terms of your son and his experience there. But you described the the years in Alabama uh, in in relationship to being the civil rights years. And now you've just spoken about the song Fight the Power, both the public enemy version and the Isley Brothers version of it. Uh, Talk to us about that chapter in your life that was connected directly to the civil rights struggle. Um, I was born in 1950. Okay, my civil rights experience Sometimes uh, this, I call it my Forrest Gump experience because it just so happened that I was where ground zero was. Now, let me explain what that means. You see, born in Cleveland, Ohio, but every Christmas, every summer, every spring break, we went to Alabama because my parents, both being from Montgomery, wanted to make sure that, that uh, us, my, me and my two siblings, uh, knew their family. Well, this was right in the height. Uh, when I'm five years old, that's when they had the Montgomery bus boycott. You know, I'm 70 years old, man. I participated in the Montgomery bus boycott, not knowing what it was because I was five years old, but I knew that my grandmother was walking all over town. Montgomery's a hilly, hilly place. You go down there, down there, 95 degrees out there, you got to walk over town. You remember that stuff, okay? All right, people that uh, you, you read in the history books, we knew, you know. Rosa Parks spoke at my cousin's funeral uh, in Detroit because they left Montgomery together, went up to Detroit. You know, uh, E.D. Nixon, you know, the Martin Luther King, I'd see them because they were there in Montgomery. Uh, it wasn't like I was a, a young revolutionary, nothing like that. It's just that they just happened to be there. Um, I have, I got those those stories that uh, people come on and talk about. Yes, I have the white water experience again, not because I was trying to be defiant, but because it was a situation. At that time, I'm never forget nine years old. They, the company's out of Warren, Ohio, too. They. They changed how you made water fountains. They they had they made the aluminum ones, and on the inside, see the water th- could retain its coolness for a while because of uh, the casing still is today. It's aluminum. All right, the white people had the aluminum ones. Black people had the porcelain ones. Where well, the porcelain rusts, so therefore, when you go to the water fountain and you look at it, you can see the red rust marks there. I simply, I'm downtown in front of uh, uh, a Woolworth in Montgomery, Alabama, drank out of the of, of the, the, the quote white women only because it was aluminum and it, it made sense. All hell breaks loose. You know, my older sister, who's five years older, you know, she's crying, literally crying to uh, 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 the police officer saying that, you know, you know, this old he from up north, he just didn't know. See, I've, I've experienced that. I have, have experienced getting on a train in Cleveland. Riding the train to Cincinnati, getting 
off the front of the train in Cincinnati going to the back because once you cross that Ohio River, you were in Kentucky and they had segregation. I know what that is about. I've experienced it. I have experienced being in Alabama uh, in the early 60s when they had the Freedom Riders coming, riding the bus back from Montgomery, coming back up to Cleveland with the Klan stopping the bus. I have experienced that, man. I've seen that. I have experienced that. And the only reason why I'm here talking to you today on this uh, show is because the Greyhound bus driver kept yelling, you take them off that bus, you're violating interstate commerce. And I didn't understand what they was mean, what that guy meant by that till I went to law school. Because I didn't know that when, when it involved interstate commerce, the feds come in. And what the Klan always wanted to do is do things within a, within a state because they can get away with it in the state. They never want the feds to come in. Greyhound buses travel interstate, which makes it federal. I, okay. I have, I have experienced that. So, yeah, that's my civil rights uh, experience, simply, simply trying to go from Cleveland to Montgomery to enjoy my family. March on Selma happened during spring break. Some said that you see these things, man. And uh, life is stuff that they make an impression inside of you. It's like planting the seed. And then the, and then the seed springs forth later on. Well, that those experiences, and there were a lot of them, yes. caused me to have a different insight later on as I began to wake up in life and understand what's going on around me. Okay. That's what I was talking about. A couple of years ago, there was a program at Kent State University, and I think it marked 50 years. Uh, I think it was like a 50 year anniversary type situation. But one thing stood out for me in that program because I was there to document it. And I actually provided some photographs for you for that that event. I'm remembering the speech that you gave. And I remember the, the metaphor that you created about the washing machine. The machine. <laughs> and that, that's something that has stuck with me all this time. We don't really have a whole lot of time left. We just have about a minute 30. But if you could give that example, just so that the folks get the benefit of what I learned on that day. You know what? And I'm gonna, I, that's a good way to close, man. Everybody <laughs> has a home, even apartments nowadays. You have a washing machine. You know, go take a moment to really look at what happens uh, in a whiffle washing machine. Because see, it goes through cycles, all of them. <laughs> they, they go through the cycles. And what you have to do in life is look at the cycles here and what you're trying to do. You see, the washing machine is ultimately trying to clean whatever fabric that you put in there. Well, you have to look at what happens first. Well, what happens first is that when you put it, when you put the uh, the fabric in there or clothing, whatever you're putting in there, well, it's dirty. And the process that it takes to first loosen that dirt is that you have this little ball in there. The, the, the modern days have a, a it, it's, it's acting within the whole unit there, but it still has the same name. It's called an agitator. Think about that word. It's an agitator. So what does that mean? It means it's shaking that cl those clothes around uh, as it's going around so that it loosens the dirt from the fabric. That's the same way it is when you start looking at change in our society here. You can, yes, you must have agitation. It's a requirement. Without agitation, you're never going to get things done. You know, don't, don't be falling for this if we're going to have kumbaya first. No, you're not. you got to agitate. And when you agitate and get the things loosen up think of what happens next you see after agitation period the machine stops and it got this dirty water in there and so now it gotta let the dirty water out but the clothes is aren't totally clean it, you just got the first part out that's why then you got to go through what's called this rinse cycle you see and you and you, when you go through the rinse cycle then it starts the whole process again getting the remainder of uh of, of you know the, the loose dirt's uh, out of there. See, then you have the spin after that. Now, I'm going to stop there, uh, Vince, for this reason. It's because very rarely do we get to the spin cycle. 
we we operate between the wash agitation cycle and the rinse. Okay. You know, well, that's why. We're going to have to leave it at the rinse cycle. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for being the agitator that you have been. <laughs> and just know that you got to fight the powers that be. Yeah, this is this has been a great conversation my brother silas ashley retired educator and attorney living in miami florida migrating to uh, cleveland during the summers we'll look forward to your visit here shortly but in the meantime thanks for joining us on open door and thanks to our audience for listening this is open door with vince robinson know yourself love yourself be yourself make today your best day peace